Um, in the meantime, you see those guys working there. We will uh, show you some, um, some methods with respect to impedance measurement, but we get to that later on. So um, there were quite a few issues that were discussed this week and a uh, few things that were picked up and I think that's true for everybody. And that's why um, I gave you some, a, a piece of paper in which you can, if you like, and if you like to stay longer than just after my talk, um, put in some questions and um, we would like to discuss those with the two or three people that are left from the plenary speakers um, in, the, uh, in this discussion. So please articulate any questions related to this, this week's workshop there and um, hand them in after my talk so that, so that we can discuss those. Now there are a few things that, that, that uh, I noticed this week. One thing is the question, for instance, do robots need biarticulate muscles? There's a question which arose, I think, uh, that was on, on Monday, um, no, on Tuesday, the discussion came on, or the question came on, somebody mentioned that. And another thing is, what um, impedance do we really need in robotic systems? So let us look into how do we measure arm impedance? Or how do we measure impedance during movement? Or how do we measure impedance from the EMG signal? All of these things were um, not really discussed this week. Nobody really went into that issue. So I would like to say a few words on that. And there was somebody who uh, said, well, controlling position out of EMG, out of uh, peripheral nervous signal, uh, system signals, is not really a possibility. So I'd like to talk about that as well shortly. And you should remember this slide from the beginning, that we should always try to learn from biology, but not copy or mimic but to understand which are the concepts and how can we use this concept or ignore these concepts in technical systems. All right, first thing I'd like to um, shortly shed a few words on is whether robots do need biarticulate muscles. Why would it be advantageous to, to use those? And this is the uh, slide that, that Jerry put on in his talk, and that's the um, force length and force velocity relationship of a muscle, and you see there that the, the uh, exerted, exerted force by a muscle is very low when the length is very low, for instance. So in this area, you get a very low possible force of the muscle, so the muscle is rather inefficient to use at a short length. So one might think, for instance, in the following setup, if you look in this um, um, picture of an arm, where I have the shoulder and the elbow joint in a planar case. And well, if you just have these kind of actuators, a muscle here, a muscle there, and down there, so you have uh, only four of the traditional six muscle model, then of course the length of a muscle um, varies strongly with the angle. So if I straighten my arm, I only have the muscles here. Of course, I have one very much elongated muscle and one very short muscle. Whereas with biarticulate muscles, the length of the muscle basically stays the same doesn't vary all that much with the movement. So you may well conclude that a reason for biarticulate muscles may be the fact that the force uh, length relationship of the muscle is totally different from that of a motor, right? And this, this relationship does not hold in a motor. So might it be useful to copy these, this idea of biarticulate muscles in, in, in technical systems. Well, if you think about motors, it may not be such a good idea to do that. And that's just one example in which you have to think of, of copying those ideas that may not always be the best idea. I'll give you another example. Um, that's human hand kinematics, and that's actually work of uh, Georg Stilfried, who's sitting right in the middle over there. And Georg has been working the last uh, four or so years, I'm not sure how many years, three or four years, on um, looking into hand kinematics. And the idea is, well, the human hand is, of course, very adept in, in, in grasping things and so on and so forth. And there are um, some um, uh, dynamics models of hands where the grasp forces are modeled and the tendons are modeled. But there is not really one good kinematic model of the hand there. So, how do we look into the kinematics of the human hand? Which of the aspects are important 
for grasping. I mean, we shouldn't forget that the world around us, at least the world that we shaped, was shaped to fit our hands. So it may just well be that the robotic gripper, which mimics our hands, may be a, a rather optimal way of grasping. So what Georg did is he um, made a large number of MRT scans of the human hand and um, did the segmentations of the bones in those MRT scans. Did the localization of those and a position estimation of each of the bones in 6, uh, six DOF. And from that, he computed an optimal configuration of the kinematics. And well, he found out some interesting things. For instance, um, there is an optimal number of degrees of freedom in the hand, um, close to 24, 25, which matches the human kinematics. And um, also he found a number of degrees of freedom in the thumb, which has been an unsolved problem to date. There are various models of how many um, degrees of freedom the thumb has. Some models say four, some models say five degrees of freedom. There is even a model saying three degrees of freedom. Um, now, that's interesting from, from a biological point of view. But is it interesting for grasping? Well, it may be. As I said in the beginning, the, uh, the world around us is shaped to fit our hands because, well, we use it with our hands. Of course, that's true for the, for the, uh, for the objects that we shaped as the size of a cup or the keys on a, on a mobile phone. So, indeed, this model is uh, the basis for the hand-arm system that's developed at the DLR. Um, it's not completely integrated. There are some small details which are integrated, and we will continue on using that. But in that case, you may just as well say, well, it does make sense to copy the kinematics of the human hand. Does it make sense to copy the dynamics of the human hand? Well, that's, that's a question uh, which is very close to that. It's a, it's a somewhat more difficult question to look into the dynamics of the human hand. Um, certainly an issue that's not solved yet. Second thing. What impedance do we really need? So let us look into how is um, human arm impedance measured. And that's work that has been going on for the last, uh, I would say, approximately 30 years. There have been very many methods developed and very many uh, issues arisen. Um, Etienne is one of the people, for instance, who works on that. David Franklin is one of the people who works on those, those issues. Um, and uh, we've looked into that, into that recently as well uh, within the, uh, the realms of the STIFF project that, that's associated with this workshop. And um, in our lab, Dominic is one of the people, and he's, he's not just an orange person, but he's also a blue person. So um, his work is related uh, to that measurement. And what Dominic did is he um, made impedance measurements with this hand arm, with the, with the uh, DLR lightweight robot. And um, well, what Dominic says is, well, of course you can make um, the rigid body dynamics of the arm the standard equation here. And if you say, well, I can define the muscle impedance as follows, then the complete torque of the system is this closed equation, where, say, the external perturbation force can be described as a combination of inertial forces, uh, Coriolis forces and gravity forces. Now, of course, one thing is that in this case, what you want to do, you do not want to measure the um, brain, so how we control the impedance during a task, but basically you want to measure the arm properties. And uh, looking into that, you have to look at the feedback that occurs when you're controlling the impedance of the arm, and you have to look into the reflexes. Now, there is one problem. There is a, a trade-off between perturbation time and the data you obtain. And the problem is there that if you make a very short perturbance, um, very short time and very short distance perturbance, what you get is a very short component which is related to the to the impedance and to the damping and you're measuring almost only measuring uh, the the inertia of the system so there's a trade-off there and that's the thing that uh, dominic has been focusing focusing on the last uh, six to eight months um, so what he does is he makes a taylor approximation of the impedance of the of the forces um, as follows and well you can simplify that by saying well well, my K is my stiffness matrix, and my D is my damping matrix. And um, if I do that 
in the planar case, so my gravity is zero, then I can reduce the whole qu equation that I have to solve to the following simplified version. And um, of that, I can make a linear identification model by just um, putting in a parameter factors of those parameters that I have to measure. So that's the, the inertia, the damping, and the stiffness. And the identification model looks like that, so it's a very um, rather straightforward way of, of estimating these parameters. And I think those guys want to demonstrate this method right now in the experimental setup. So what's being done in this case is that we use um, perturbations. And the perturbations look like that, so they're perturbations in the order of uh, 100 milliseconds. So you see the, the, the joint perturbations in the rat and the, uh, the torque here. And that's done over a sequence of uh, 30 iterations. And I'll let you guys do that. One minute. So what we do here, even though the robot is, uh, is a torque-controlled robot, um, we use it in position mode and um, by some pre-control, the, the stiffness of the uh, system can be improved, the, the, the response of the system can be improved, and then we are able to do a perturbation in the order of one centimeter within uh, about 90 to 100 milliseconds. So the task, as you see on the dis display to your left, is to exert a certain force in x, y, and z directions. In fact, the z direction is uh, supposed to be the relaxed force, so we're only looking into a certain force task in the x and y direction. And after a few seconds of uh, stabilization, the system exerts a random perturbation. Random meaning the direction of perturbation is random. Excuse me? That's right. We measure the forces. That's right. So you find, find the force torque sensor over here. The JR3 force torque sensor, which measures the forces and the torques as well. Are you going to show the result online? All right. It's going to be on this screen. Yeah. Yes. How are you measuring the elbow angles? Say it again. Could you please stand up and get your microphone? It's easier. Yeah. How are you measuring the elbow angle? The, the angle? Yeah. Uh, which angle? The elbow, angle of the elbow, like the delta Q that you have. Of the arm? The, yeah. Of the human arm? Yeah. We don't. 
Oh, I thought on the graph up there is that the. That's the that's the position of the robot. <sighs> okay. That's right. Stiffness. That's stiffness. So that's a stiffness ellipse. And what you notice in this case is that it's uh, directed along the, the z-axis because Dominic had to exert a high force in that direction. So that's why it's very stiff in that direction. And very um, so there's hardly any stiffness in the perpendicular direction. So that's more or less a standard way of, of estimating these kind of uh, ellipses. And I've plotted a few other ones here where you get, depending on the position of the arm, you get, of course, uh, somewhat different orientations and different sizes of the stiffness as well as of the damping characteristics of the arm. So you can measure those with this rather simple methods. But that's not all. Um, of course, it's nice to have those in, in two degrees of freedom, but it's much nicer to have those in, in three degrees of freedom. So how are we going to do that? And that's uh, basically the same problem in this case. There are a few uh, nasty issues involved, such as the size of the explorator, uh, um, um, of, the, of the exploration that has to be done. So the number of measurements is very, very large in that case. But there are also some numerical problems with respect to this. As I said, the uh, effect of the inertia is much larger than the effect of the, um, of the stiffness and of the damping. So estimating all three parameters is not a very easy thing to do. But another issue is, as I mentioned, the effect of feedback. So there's the spinal feedback um, and the stretch reflect feedback. And the question is, well, what are we actually measuring in this case? We have perturbation times of uh, in the order of 90 milliseconds, and it takes then another uh, 30 to 50 milliseconds for the whole system to stabilize. So we're in the order of 150 milliseconds. And you're already measuring some part of the feedback in that case. So um, how, what can you do about that? And the third question is, well, can you use EMG to make a map between the stiffness and the um, EMG value so that you don't need to actually measure stiffness anymore, but estimate it from the EMG signal? So let's look at another thing, which is measuring impedance during the movement, Bram. Um, well, the disturbances we apply depend on the um, uh, depend on the on the time you have, first of all, and what you want to measure. So, in all the cases that I have seen and that are stable, uh, you measure basically um, the the impedances after the perturbation and not during the perturbation, because the n number of information that you can stably get there. Oh, that's what you mean. That's that's right. That's right. That's indeed an issue. Yeah. And the next is uh, work done by Hannes Höppner, who's been sitting all week up there recording our talks. And um, Hannes is working. This thing crashed. Oh, that's fun. It crashes a lot, but never during a talk. Hannes, as I said, wanted to say, is working on uh, intrinsic impedance. And, um, well, if you look into that, there are, of course, as I mentioned, 
the standard way of, uh, of, of measuring impedance, and you see uh, a setup by David Franklin. It's a rather old setup, but he's done some newer work. And uh, on the right, you see the, um, the air jet, in which, as far as I know, Neville was involved as well in the 1980s. Um, the problems of the existing methods, first of all, well, in the, in the, uh, in the static meth methods, as we demonstrated just now, is first of all a drawback that it's not wearable, so you can only do it in a very specific setting. When you're sitting in a chair and doing a specific predefined task, um, and so far, it's with a very, very few exceptions, it's only been done in planar movements. Whereas, whereas to um, wearable force perturbation setups, um, Neville, correct me if I'm wrong in, in these remarks, but the forces are rather low. Um, and um, one of the problems seemed to be that precise control of the device was problematic, and that was one of the reasons why that was discontinued, as far as I'm informed. So, um, what we are trying to look at is to define a system um, in which you do the acceleration and deceleration of a mass inside a tube, and you use the energy, you get the energy from the outside. So, in this case, we use an air compressor to put in a large amount of energy, and through that, we get very short impact times, less than 25 milliseconds for the whole perturbation. And uh, we use a number of these devices in order to get more than one degree of freedom. If you use only one device on your arm, which you can just fix here, you get the rotational movement, of course, only. But by using more of these devices, you can do more than that. Now, the implementation we've realized so far is uh, a steel tube length, as you see the top left, with uh, 13 centimeters length and 300 grams of weight, external relays, um, and uh, some magnets to increase the counterforce of the air pressure, and force sensors between the arm and the device. Now, the bad news is that so far we only have results on the device properties. So what you see here is the result of the simulation of the system, how the uh, force relates to the, to the time after, after the, 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 uh, um, the uh, weight has been shot through the air. Um, uh, and that corresponds very well with the model of that. However, first uh, measurements of the device on the human arm are not available yet for one of the problems being, as I mentioned, the problem of uh, that you most measure, you mostly measure inertia rather than damping and stiffness. So that's the thing that's still being looked into. But we've realized that in grasp stiffness. So what Hannes has been doing, he's been building device for doing um, grasp stiffness measurements and it's a very small device you can hold in the hand and it's just a spring loaded passive device in which there is an acceleration sensor and a force sensor and um, electromagnets and by releasing the air electromagnets the perturbation is done over a predefined length of usually one centimeter. So an experiment has been done of, on a number of uh, healthy subjects in the pinch grasp, and the, they hold the grasp uh, perturber, which is just lying on the table, and uh, we estimate the maximum grasp force of a subject, um, divide that in, in normalized force levels, and then perform a perturbation between two and four seconds after the force level has been reached. And the results are as follows, and you get, damn it. Oh, it's crashing again. So we'll have a long talk today, sorry for that. Unless anybody has a Windows machine for me. There you go. Um, what you get is a very nice linear relationship between the exerted force, the, the normalized force levels that you see in the bottom there. So that's the amount of force, uh, percentage of force that's of the maximum force that's exerted before the perturbation. And then the stiffness is, uh, is, is measured through the perturbation. And um, as I said, it's a very fast perturbation in the order of five milliseconds. So you're definitely only measure, measuring intrinsic properties here. Basically, that linear relationship implies that you have a 
exponential stiffness, and that's what you're basically measuring at the tendon. Now the question is, of course, well, why is this interesting? And one of the answers is the implication of that for robotic systems may be very interesting, and in that the um, nonlinear relationship, the exponential relationship between the force and the uh, and the stiffness. Um, uh, rather, the linear relationship between the force before the perturbation and the stiffness may be something that we want to attain in robotic systems. Then again, the question arises once more, do we want to look into copying that behavior or do we want to look into understanding that behavior? Is it just a property of the tendon which may not interest us or is it necessary for grasping? The next thing estimating impedance from EMG. So there has been um, some discussion on that uh, in which somebody said the, um, we can estimate from EMG a stiffness signal. So we can estimate the stiffness of the arm, but we cannot estimate the position. Well, that's, that's true up to a certain extent in that, of course, with the EMG signal, you measure muscular activity. And muscular activity is basically the force that the muscle exerts. So in a way that's true, but you can look at it from another point of view as well. And I'll show you two things there, or two and a half. And the next person who hasn't been here this week, so you haven't seen him, but um, he's been helping us behind the screens, it's Claudio. And um, Claudio's work is uh, concentrated on hand prosthetics and rehabilitation, and there's of course a lot of EMG work in there. So what we did many years ago, is looking into grasp force from EMG and finger movement from EMG. And the original idea was to look into um, prosthetic applications. So how can I control a prosthetic hand from this signal? So what we did is we equipped a person with, uh, I think it's 10 electrodes, commercial EMG electrodes, very simple machines with respect to using them, and uh, a force torque sensor. And we trained the system to map the EMG signal on, um, on the exerted force and the finger movements. And these are some quantitative results. On the left, you see the um, classification of a finger movement, and that's for five fingers, flexion or extension. And on the right, you see the um, force level that's exerted. And you see that on the force level, we have an error in the order of 10%. If you look in pinch, pinch grasp or in um, uh, power grasp. And the result is something like this. So on the first experiment, what you see is a mapping of finger movement, flexion or extension of the thumb, of the index finger, and of the other three fingers. This is a very old movie. This is from 90, uh, two, 2006, so that's five years ago. In the second part, you see the exertion of grasp force, only controlled through EMG, so we can have high force or low force. And it's actually rather applicable to kitchen scenarios, for instance. Now, as a sidestep, this has also... Subject happens. You squeeze some ultrasound gel on the forearm. This has been done with an ultrasound interface as well. And then you have the ultrasound machine probe lean against the forearm of the subject. And now we have some sample movements, such as flexing alternatively some of the fingers. And this is what can be seen on the screen of the ultrasound machine. So as one can see, there's a clear correspondence between, there's something which is moving exactly as the fingers are moving. So now second sequence, the subject wears first a cotton glove. And after that, he wears the 18 sensors, cyber glove, data glove that we use to gather the finger position.
That's it. Yeah. Now, third phase, we uh, train the system by letting the probe gather ultrasound images of the forearm, meanwhile asking the subject to do some predefined movements. That's what the subject is doing now, so it's actually flexing the index, flexing the middle, flexing the ring, flexing the pinky, so the four parallel fingers, so to speak, flexing the index, flexing the pinky, exactly. And then we have thumb rotation, and then thumb abduction, which is barely visible here, but that means putting the thumb close to the, close to the, uh, to the hand palm. The glove is recording the values corresponding to the positions of the fingers, and at the same time, the ultrasound probe, which is now steadily fixed uh, against the skin of the subject, is recording the images that correspond to the muscular movements. And now for the final phase, now our subject has trained the system to associate um, yeah, finger movements and finger positions with features taken from the ultrasound images. And now the system is just reading the ultrasound images and moving the model, the hand model on the screen accordingly. As you can see, the system is not only is not only understanding what's going on, but it's understanding the synergetic, the synergistic movement. So when the subject flexes the index finger, as he's doing now, or the middle finger, then all the other fingers move accordingly because that's what they do, really. And that's what, what they were doing when, the, uh, when the, um, the data were collected with the glove. And even the thumb can be, even, although, although a little bit, with a little bit more difficulty, uh, even the, the rotation of the thumb can be, can be understood. Yeah, that, yeah. Now in the last section, we show some prediction online while our subject is flexing the fingers. And accordingly, you can see on the left-hand side of the movie what the ultrasound machine is recording. In real time, we are gathering 128 feature points from the image the image that you see on the ultrasound machine and converting that via a linear interpolation to the finger positions which are then transmitted to the hand model on the screen and that essentially closes the loop. Now it certainly doesn't surprise you that this method will also work to uh, look not just into finger movements but also into finger forces. You can go on with these kind of interfaces. And now I'm getting to Jörn Vogel, who is not only the uh, lab manager, but also one of the blue people working on semi-autonomous robotics for brain-machine interfaces. And um, the first thing I show is uh, collaborative work between him and Claudio. Um, so w we've been looking into hand EMG. Where I say, well, you have the static finger forces is what we are mapping from the EMG signal with a rather limited accuracy. But um, the qualitative visual feedback solves that limited accuracy. You can see how much force you're exerting. You can measure that. You can, you can guess that. And that's good enough. In the case of ARM EMG, however, the situation is slightly different. So what, um, what we did is we extended the hand EMG situation by adding electrodes on the upper arm and the shoulder, and a total of, um, I think it was eight electrodes that we used in order to measure grasp force and arm movements, or arm position rather. And in this case, in fact, while the EMG signal is no longer statically related to the position of the force, but rather we have a component related to gravity and a component related to the impedance or the stiffness and a component related to the acceleration. And another problem is that we do expect an increased muscle activity close to the target because you want to be more precise there. So to solve that, we looked into task-oriented training. And what you get if you do that, so the setup is in that we uh, do an offline training situation in which we measure the 60 position of the wrist of the person uh, using optical tracking systems and measure the EMG data at the same time. And what you see in this plot is uh, the X, Y, and Z error 
in the whole reach phase of the arm. So we extend, we use the full reach phase of the arm while keeping the shoulder um, immobilized. And you see, well, the, the arrows aren't all that large. There are some areas where the arrows are large. And you can see that um, in a situation where you map the EMG signal on the position, and you see the, the, the black uh, line is the position that is measured with the tracking system, and the red is the um, predicted signal from the EMG data. And you'll find on the average an error or in, in the order of th five to, to seven centimeters within the whole reach phase, which is much better than we attained in the grasp force situation. But still, it's a totally different situation. The next video shows that. And this is the result, result that is obtained after a training of approximately 15 minutes in which the data are gathered. Well, this goes on for a while. But you see here that the, the accuracy of the system, even though it's higher than in the uh, hand case, is still problematic, since you need qualitative, uh, quantitative feedback in order to correct that. So we are currently looking into how to improve that. And one way we want to go is to remove the static EMG signal related to the gravity using blind source separation, so that we can only control um, that we can control the two sources separately, once the position on the other side, the acceleration exerted from the muscles. And nonetheless, of course, you don't want to use these kind of systems for teleoperation, but we're looking into applying that to a robotic rehabilitation. And that brings me to the last uh, thing I want to talk about, and that's again work of Jörn, in a collaboration we do with uh, Brown University. And what Brown University has been looking into is to neuromotor prosthesis in order to help patients with ALS, with spinal cord injuries, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, what they've been doing for the last, uh, I would say, six to seven years is implanting assistive devices um, in the motor cortex. And that's in the form of the brain gate array which is a four by four millimeter platform which is inserted into the motor cortex of a patient. And um, that's, that's a permanent implant. And the data is then moved outside in order to use in specific settings. And this is an, a video of how that works. Will undergo a surgical procedure where a small sensor is placed on the area of the brain responsible for movement. This sensor is connected to a pedestal that is attached to the skull and protrudes through the skin. The sensor records electrical signals from the brain, and these signals are fed into a device where they are interpreted by an operator using special software. From there, the signals are fed to a computer through which a study participant will attempt to control a cursor on a computer screen. The goal of the study is to evaluate the quality, type, and usefulness of cursor control that participants can achieve by using their thoughts. All right, so what you see here is a 2D cursor control through this imp that implant. And that's been realized, I think, thir first time around 2004, 2005. I don't know the precise year anymore. So what we've done in the collaboration is extend that to a setting in which the patient is allowed to control a robotic system through the same device. And the setup is as follows, in which the patient observes the robot while the data are being gathered. And um, 
the goal of that whole work is to, first of all, reinstate autonomy to disabled people. So what we do is we combine the brain gate system with our robotic lightweight robot arm and the five finger hands to do the grasping. And the general approach to that is we um, record from the brain gate the uh, local field potentials, count the spiking rates, and from that uh, those are deco decoded and matched with Cartesian velocities and the Cartesian velocities are commanded to the robot, which then executes its movement, and of course the visual feedback aids the patient to control the system. Now, the uh, decoding is done, as I said, by spike counts, and um, we record and learn the mapping from the matching of the two. The problem, however, is that there is no ground truth because we do not really know what the, what the participant wants to do. If the participant wants to uh, move to the right or move to the left, the only thing we can do is to do a training session in which the um, robot is moved in a certain direction and the participant should be executing the same movement with the non-working limbs. And the same method is used in cross coding. So what you see here is a training session in which a robot makes a predefined movement. And executes the grasp. And the participant is instructed in the same time to perform the same movement. And after the learning phase of the system, this is uh, actual control by the participants. This is only one dimensional. Bring it to the black But it's also been done in two dimensions. Let, let uh, Katie know or something if you want to, but I think it's okay to get a sense of how it works. So in this case, the task is to grasp the glass and to drop it at a pretty fine location. But in principle, the system works. It's not perfect. Decoding is one problem is only valid for a rather short time. So what we find is that after in the order of 30 minutes, sometimes it's a bit longer, sometimes it's a bit shorter, but the decoding is not correct anymore. And what we have to do is to retrain the system. One problem maybe is that we are actually not finding velocity related signals in the cortex. And that we might look, uh, have to look more into uh, impedance control. The second thing is that um, high dimensional control needs improvement. We've done three dimensional control and uh, have had some good results, but uh, they're linearly decreasing with the number of degrees of freedom, I would say. So in one degree of freedom, it's, it's almost perfect. In two degrees, we have in the order of, what is it, 50 to 70%. And in three degrees, it goes down to 30% order of or even less. So there's quite some improvement 
to be done there. Um, we need an online adaptation of the decoding. That's the major problem, as how do we understand what the patient wants to do while she is controlling the robot. Nonetheless, we have a vision of installing these kind of systems with tetraplegic patients in order to uh, give them back some dexterity in their life. But sometimes this works also well. And this is again 2D control. where the task always is to place the bottle on the white spot. We're controlling uh, uh, velocities. Well, the, to my best of knowledge, the classical theories have been that uh, there are velocities, uh, position-dependent velocities en encoded in the M1 motor cortex. So that's why this approach is taken. But it might be that it, we have Neville. You want to say something, Neville? You have a I thought so. So um, it might be that, uh, that, that with different encodings we will get better results. Uh, one of the issues that's certainly a case here is that the um, position of the robot with respect to the patient is very uh, disadvantageous. We've had some recent results where the patient is sitting with in the robot, basically, and those results are considerably better, but that's not released yet. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>